Hello and welcome to Off the Fence, a podcast where we deconstruct difficult decision making so we can find out what keeps us stuck and more importantly, how do we get unstuck? I'm your host, Karen Covey, a former divorce lawyer, mediator, and arbitrator turned coach, author, and entrepreneur. With me today is Leslie Glazier. And Leslie is a divorce real estate specialist with over 20 years experience in residential real estate serving the Chicago area. She's one of a select group of realtors who's been designated a certified divorce real estate expert, CDRE, and a certified divorce specialist. She's a founding member of the Amicable Divorce Network, and she's a top 1% residential broker with At Properties Christie's International Real Estate. Leslie, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. It's so good to see you. It is good to see you again. And I know I see you, I I feel like I see you everywhere because you do so (laughs) much and you've been such a stable in the real estate market in Chicago for so long. So I just have been dying to ask you, why real estate? How did you get into this? Why, you know, you, you've been doing it for a a very long time. You've sold, I think over a hundred million dollars in real estate over the years. Where did this passion for real estate come from? Oh my gosh, good question, Karen. Um, Actually, my father was an estate planner. And when I was in high school, he would talk about investment that he made. And I did just kind of, what is that? What's that all about? And I looked into colleges. The only place to major in real estate at the time was American University. So that's where I went. And I majored in real estate. And I majored in real estate and psychology. And I kind of am doing the same thing now. (laughs) <laughs> I can a hundred percent relate, but what, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I think this is something that people might not realize is how much psychology is really involved in buying and selling. So how have you found that your study of psychology helps you in what you do today? Well, you know, and my mother and stepfather are clinical therapists, so that also comes <laughs> You've got it from all directions. All over, yes. Uh, everyone in my family is, my, my son is in real estate, my brother's in real estate. Anyway, um, you know, there's a lot of options and um, uh, gosh, it, my, my brain is just <laughs> going, repeat the question, I'm sorry. Okay, so, you know, we talked about where your passion for real estate uh-huh. came from. Um, but why, I mean, how does psychology fit into that? Because you have the background in psychology your family background in psychology. How do you make use of that in the decision-making process, buying, selling, and everything that goes along with selling real estate or buying it? Thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm very, I've always been very interested in next chapters and, the decisions of, you know, are you renting? Are you uh, downsizing, getting married, having a baby? It's, it's, I'm so um, interested in that life cycle and finding that next stage of your life and where you are and what you're doing. Um, There's so much, so many decisions that go into that, but it's very different for a first time buyer than someone that's on three homes or second home and getting in that mindset and, being able to understand where they're coming from. That's that's interesting, but I love your idea of next chapter because Mm -hmm. in order to start the next chapter, usually it starts with a decision. Sometimes it's an accident, like a baby could be an oops, right? But at some point, if you trace things back far deeply enough, there was a decision about, okay, we're going to buy a house or it's, you know, we're going to get a divorce. We're going to have a baby. We're going to downsize, downsize all what characterizes a next chapter is some sort of a decision. So is that when people come to you, have they usually already made the decision or do you help them with that? Both. Some people have, you know, looked on Zillow forever and they know what they want. And then there's other people that say, we're not going to buy for a year. We're thinking about what we want. Can you help us? Can you? So my job a lot of the time is to just 
find out the wants, the needs, the business decision, desires, you know, it all kind of fits together. So at the beginning, when someone says, yes, this is ABC that I definitely have to have, I have to have my parking, my dog, my in-unit washer dryer. Okay. But beyond that, I want, I want to help them explore options, you know, and do they want a lot of maintenance? Do they want a single family house or would they prefer to be in a high rise or building where they don't have to, you know, do tuck pointing and roof, roof work and all of that. So it's, it's a lot of questions, but Karen, for me is once I'm with a client and just see a few homes with them, that's all I need. I can tell what they want and I might introduce them to a property they've never thought of or seen in terms of, hmm, you'd like open space entertaining, how about a loft? Or, you know, just, it's just opening their minds to places and explore different properties, which is really yeah. fun. Yeah. And what I want to do, I want to bring into the conversation something we were talking about before we started to, you know, go on air, so to speak, which is the client that you had that thought that they wanted a house in the suburbs and, you know, once you started working with them, you opened their minds to other options. Can you tell that story? Because that's fascinating. I think it, it, it speaks to, we don't always know what we want, right? Absolutely. They're coming from California in a home and they have a two-year-old and one on the way. Um, they said to me, We're, we would like to be, our friends say to be in the Western suburbs. I said, okay, great. I'll give you a recommendation, but if you want to you know, have any conversations with me. Of course, I'm around. They called the next day and said, we saw places in the Western suburbs. They're beautiful. But would you consider showing us some places in the city? Because I, I, we just we just want to kind of get that out of our head that we don't want to be there. So the first day I took them to high rises and said, wow, you could have a pool. You could, you know, have a gorgeous view of the lake. So we we did that. The second day we did townhomes and properties where we thought, you know, their child would just, you know, fit right in, not have to go down an elevator and all of that. So then they thought, oh my gosh, we fell in love with this vintage high rise, but is that going to work for our little one? Because the townhouses were just so great. And so we kind of explored the options of location, what they want. The child can, of course, you know, be happy anywhere of the children. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, they picked a high, they picked a gorgeous vintage high rise on the lake. And they said, you know, we're never going to probably do this for a while. We want this fun chapter in our lives. And we're going to do something different that we've never, you know, never done before. That's that's a great story. And it just goes to show you that number one, we don't always want what we think we want first. Right. And second of all, it starts, it sounds like part of your process, and it's similar to the process that I take my clients through in making any kind of a big decision is understanding what your options are. Yes. Right? I often tell people that if you don't know you have an option, it you're you're not, it's not a decision, right? You didn't decide not to do that thing. You didn't know you could, right? Exactly. <laughs> So it's how you, it sounds like when you work with clients, a big part of it in the beginning is figuring out what are your options? What do you really want? And what are you willing to try on? Right. And a lot of, yes. And a lot of people think, well, my friends have this, or someone told me I need to move to this or that. And no, not necessarily. And even price-wise, people get into a mindset of, I need to be at this price, but if they want to be in a place that has a high assessment or taxes, you know, we have to balance everything out and, and, you know, make sure that it all works together, you know, and point out maintenance, point out the assessments and what they are in the building. And, you know, it's just, it's a very thoughtful process and, they need, I, I want to make sure that they understand what they're getting themselves, you know, in for, of course, but, um, you know, having that option of saying, okay, I, would, I want a single family home, or I want a townhouse or a high rise. And you can always tell Karen, when they walk into a place and their, their whole face lights up, you're like, oh, this is the best part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> they're happy. 
That, yep, that's 100% awesome. I know when I purchased real estate myself, it's like you walk in and you, and I, I know that I'm probably not a good negotiator for myself in that instance, because you can't help but see like, oh yeah, we got her. She wants this place, you know? So how do you help people? All right. So they, they've gone in, they know that they want this place, whatever this place is. How do you help them decide what to, you know, like, how do you negotiate? How do you say to them, okay, here's the asking price. How do you help them make all the decisions that go into negotiating and actually getting a contract on that deal? Well, first of all, they, if they're not a cash buyer, they have to be pre-approved by a lender. So they're going to, that's first step. And they're going to at least know their, you know, where they need to be in terms right. of when it comes to negotiations, um, it really depends how long the property has been on the market. If it's, you know, cause I always put my mind in the seller's head and think, okay, is this a brand new property? You know, they think they're going to be up here or has it been sitting two months and maybe they're thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to keep this listing in the winter? I might want to unload it. So, you know, talking to the other, other agent and finding out it's not always price of what sellers want. Maybe they want to close in November, um, you know, have a delayed closing or rent back. So I, I want to, I want to understand where the seller's coming from and what they want first. That's so important um, for negotiations. And, you know, there's things that, you know, in a multiple offer situation that I've had my clients win, you know, 95% of the time, um, they can, they can do things like, you know, if they're comfortable with it and we talk about it, they can waive an appraisal contingency. They can waive an inspection contingency, maybe as is, but they have to understand what they're getting themselves into. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of options, not just on price. And, uh, there's also something called an escalation clause. Do you know what that is? I don't. It's, <laughs> it's um, you know, if you're making an offer on a property that's at say 500,000, but you don't want to bid against yourself, if the seller will accept it, you can say, okay, I'm going to go to 505, you know, my, my offer is 505, but I will go to 550. I will pay a thousand dollars more than any other bona fide offer. We have to see that offer up to a cap of 550. And a lot of times, you know, maybe the last person was at 514 and then my clients got to the 515. That's awesome. That's really, I like that. I really like that, especially in today's market, because what I've heard from realtors across the board is that it's definitely a seller's market. There's still not enough inventory. I don't know if that's changing. Um, well, in the suburbs, if you have a turnkey property, you know, townhouse, condo, those go really well. Um, high rises, the more ones that haven't been renovated, you know, since early 2000s. They're, they're, that's it's today's market. Today's buyers, for the most part, are so used to seeing, you know, HGTV, design to sell, real properties, all of these model homes everywhere. So when you walk into something that's you know dated, they have a hard time with that. So the, some of the high rises that maybe don't have in-unit washer dryers or that are dated air conditioning units, yeah. things like that are their top. That, that makes total sense. But, you know, listening to you and listening to all of the, the things that you do and the factors that play into it, I, I know the answer. I think I know the answer to this question already, but, you know, with the internet, with Zillow, with everything that's out there, so many people say, well, I don't need a realtor. I can do this myself. What would you say to that? What value does a realtor bring to the to the buyer or seller that they wouldn't otherwise have? Well, first of all, they're only seeing what's on Zillow. So they're, they don't know so much more. Brokers work together and say, we've got a listing coming up. You know, so even there's a private listing network. So there's a lot that goes behind the scenes. And they're not represented in terms of negotiations, which could go way south. You know, I will, if you're buying a condo, are you going to really understand that there's a special assessment coming up in two years that no one's really told you about? Or um, did someone really explain that the bones of this house weren't, you know, so great or 
You know, I mean, there, there's so much in terms of negotiations, but also when I'm working with clients, buyers, I dig around. My favorite thing is I have a, I have a client that said, I want to be in downtown Evanston right near, you know, the lake. And so I mailed a bunch of, you know, I, I knew the houses I thought she would be good at. I mailed those <clears throat> owners and said, I have a buyer if anyone's interested. And two people got back to me and, and she bought it. And was never in the market. So both parties were super happy. So you would never get that if you're looking on Zillow. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, yeah. I'd also like to talk about another area that I know you do. I don't want to leave this conversation without talking about your expertise in divorce, right? Um, because in that situation, um, there, you know, people aren't happy. They may be either selling or one person's trying to buy the other one out. There's a lot of angst between the two. Can you, first of all, explain what a CDRE is and what value you bring to a divorcing couple above and beyond either a regular realtor or doing it themselves? Right. Yeah, well, it took a lot of training. It still does. We, we talk almost every day. But basically, you know, I expedite listings, sale of real property. Um, in a, I'm, a, I'm a neutral. So I okay. work for the house. And, you know, I work with family law attorneys and, uh, you know, what's really interesting, Karen, is that so many parties reach out to their attorneys for every question about the house. And when I come on board, I'm like, please don't do that. I'm going to save you thousands and thousands of dollars because attorneys, that's not their wheelhouse. They don't want to be involved in real estate. And so when everything comes to me, I'm like, I'm the neutral. And I, I work with parties that absolutely haven't talked in a year. They only talk through the attorneys, as I'm sure you know. And so I'm the go-between. And I create a timeline. I have a certain protocol that, you know, if I meet with one first, then I meet with the other. If we're selling the house, I don't help one buy it too. You know, no dual agency. Um, so I'm keeping, if there's a very specific timeline that I keep everyone on. Um, another thing that's really interesting is the expenses. So if, it, if we're getting, you know, the house ready to sell, if we get to that point, you know, maybe husband does the paint and wife does staging or whatnot. I keep an Excel spreadsheet that's on a Google Doc. Well, it's not Excel, but it's Google Doc. Um, <laughs> and even the uh, attorneys see it. So it's very transparent. And I say, who has spent what, from what account? And then however their agreement is, it will get balanced out in the net proceeds. That's a really, really beneficial service. Um, that's amazing. I haven't heard anyone else who does that, but that's because that's also something that is always argued about. It's like, well, I don't want to pay for that because I'm not going to get reimbursed for it. And by having that spreadsheet that everybody sees right. can make a huge difference. And a general realtor might not think to contact, you know, the attorney and, and ask where the net proceeds are going to go. Because that's a very dangerous thing, if you know. Talk where they more go. about that. What do you mean? Can you explain I mean a bit? that you know, say you know, even if one, they're both on the mortgage, one is on title. Just the net, you know, do the net proceeds go to husband? Who has talked about this? Who has even brought this up? What What was in the agreement? Yeah. So there's, I do a lot of issue spotting, and see things in advance that you know just kind of try to make sure they don't happen. <laughs> oh yeah, that it, it's a whole lot easier to avoid the problem before you have it than it is to deal with it once it's already in your life. And and I think that's that's also so important. I mean, I also help people do a similar thing. It's like it, it, so many times in coaching I say to people, "Okay, you're selling the house exactly to your point. What are you doing with the money?" And what's getting paid from the money, right? And people just say, oh, well, we'll just put it in a joint account with both of our names. Well, that's great. But that still means one of you could drain the account. Right. You know, yeah. so it's about, and, and it's not about expecting the worst. It's, you know, expecting the best, but preparing for the worst, right? And making sure everything is crystal clear about 
what's getting paid, who's getting paid, who's not getting paid, what happens to the money, even if all that's happening to the money is you're holding it. So you figure it out. And there's so much, you know, to get a house prepped and ready these days, you know, is, is a lot. And if, if someone's thinking about if one of the spouses is thinking of a buyout, you know, people kind of forget, should I have an inspection on the house? Because then I want to know what I'm in for. And here's my typical scenario that happens a lot is, you know, the wife wants to stay in the house, buy out the husband, stay there for three years until the kids go off to college. Okay, I understand that. That makes sense. You want to keep things, you know, status quo, but <laughs> the big but. Um, are you going to have an inspection and maybe $20,000 worth of work is needs to be done when you sell? So are you going to deal with that? Are you going to split it now? Um, you know, also it costs about seven to eight percent of the sale, you know, of the purchase price to close. So do you want that whole expense in three years? You know, so there's all these things to think about. I had a client who was absolutely wanted to stay in her condo, you know, just very adamant about it, even though the numbers didn't make sense. And I asked the property manager for the last two years of meeting minutes. And it turns out they talked about, she didn't know it, but they talked about a $40,000 per unit special assessment that she would have had. Ooh, that could have been, that would have been bad. Horrible. Yeah. So there's a lot of expenses that come in. So there's just, you know, um, ordering a payoff letter is another thing that's really kind of interesting. So if you, you know, whether you're going to sell or whatnot, but if you order a payoff, it's not the same as your mortgage statement, your monthly statement that you might get in the mail or online. It doesn't show. I had one client that it was thousands of dollars of difference because they had a lot of late penalties and that doesn't pop up on the statement. But when you get the payoff, you understand the exact number. Interesting. So, and for those people who might not know what a payoff is, it's that when you're closing the sale, you've got to pay off the old mortgage, right? So you order a letter that says from the mortgage company, what's, what's that bottom line? What's the amount that needs to be paid? That, you know, there are so many nuggets here for people who might be either selling the house or, you know, I, I've never had this conversation with somebody on the podcast about what you need to think of if you're keeping the house, if you're going to buy out your spouse. I mean, yes, hopefully you've run numbers and you know whether you can afford the mortgage, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more involved to keeping the house. Just oh my gosh. I mean, even the expenses are the expenses like likely to exceed the appreciation of the house of all the things. That's you interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's looking at, you know, how much money are you going to make and how much money is it going to cost you to make that? And do your numbers make sense for you? Right. And as we both know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, we're talking about psychology there is probably nothing that's more emotional than buying or selling a house, right? Oh. Well, there's some things, but it's it's definitely <laughs> way up there. It is way um, up there. And so, Daunting. you know, even if the numbers aren't perfect, there may be emotional reasons why you want to keep a house or not, you know, but it's about factoring in. You've brought up so many points that I don't think people think about, Right. If, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you get into it. And there's there's so much fear and so many decisions. And, you know, it takes a village, especially when you're going through divorce. Um, oh, yeah. I, you just, it's just impossible to just talk to like an attorney. You know, you just, you just need so many people on your side, so many experts. A hundred percent. And I think that one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that using the right expert to do the job they're actually qualified to do makes a huge difference. A lot of people think it's going to cost more money to have all this, this team, right? But yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty much, a, I put on my advisor hat and there's no charge. Mm -hmm. There's only, you know, I mean, if I sell the property, of course, there's commission, but other than that, 
you know, I, I, I can't tell you how rewarding and wonderful it is that I can provide information to people and make informed decisions. It's just so much better than just working in real estate. You know, it, it's, it's more, it's just more thoughtful and interesting and helpful. Yeah. And what, what you said so eloquently and it just slid by, but I want people to realize is making informed decisions, yes. right? Um, that, well, and you can't make an informed decision until you have information. I mean, that seems pretty basic, but people don't realize what they don't know. Right. And just providing, you know, not only options, but, uh, vendors. And, you know, I was just with someone the other day that said, oh my gosh, I have so much in my house. I need to declutter. And I've got all these books, art books, valuable, this, and, you know, I have a team of people that can consign and donate and pick up. And, and that's just huge because it's, it, people get stuck. They're like, I'm not going to move yet because I have too much to do. I have too much to clean up. Yeah. Up. Pe people, you know, and that, that's a really, really good point because part of what keeps people stuck is being overwhelmed. And so many of us have so much stuff, or maybe to your point before, you're living in a house that needs some work, you know, you haven't done it, it hasn't been updated in longer than you can remember. And so this needs to be fixed or that. Um, trying to find the, the right person, trying to find the handyman or the roofer or the painter or the like that's enough to make anybody get stuck. It's daunting. But at the same time, you know, I, I have this little expertise where I'm, I like to help people. I walk through a place that maybe is dated, but I say, okay, let's change the knobs on the hardware in the kitchen and the closet doors. Lighting is huge. It doesn't have to cost much, but people just love lighting. You know, it could be just a really cool ikea chandelier i mean it could be anything but it's just fun and whimsical and different so just it's a lot of hardware and lighting sometimes of course painting um but that goes a long way so you don't always have you don't have to spend you don't always have to spend a lot you just have to kind of create a, a fun whimsical updates yeah and again this shows or you know for those who are, who are listening you can hear how having someone who is really an expert in this, someone who's done this a long time can change the sale, right? It can, I would think that the work that you do in making those little updates and having the right eye to see things that, you know, you don't see when you live in a house all, you know, all day, all night, every day for years, right? You just stop seeing things and to have your expertise and show people, yeah, this little change, that little change will make it easier to sell. And I would expect it also makes a difference in the, difference in the sale, sales price. Absolutely. I mean, I have a to-do list that I'll give them and we'll go through it. And, you know, but it, it isn't this daunting, oh my gosh, you need to do, 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 do. It's I'm going to help you with this, or here's the vendor that can help you with that. I always create links of my favorite lighting for the different rooms. So it's, it's, it's like a cheat sheet of what they need to do, what we need to do together to get it sold. Um, staging's huge. I mean, if it's vacant or whatnot. So, I mean, it, people are pretty um, open. They get really excited. And as they finish, Karen, as they finish the to-do list, every single time they say, wow, I'm going to stay. <laughs> I know. That's what I was thinking, you know, that by the time you get done sprucing the place up, you're like, it's never looked this good. Yeah. <laughs> and why didn't I do this years ago and have the benefit of enjoying it? Right. <laughs> so you bring a lot to the table, whether people are divorcing, whether they're just going, whether they're facing any kind of life transition, looking at a next chapter, whatever that might look like. Um, you are a fount of knowledge and wisdom. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing some of the little nuggets with the audience here. And if people want to follow up with you, where can they find you? My email is probably the easiest, leslie at leslieglazer.com. And certainly my website is leslieglazergroup.com. That's wonderful. Leslie, thank you so much for sharing 
all of the, the, the nuggets of wisdom that you've shared with us. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who are listening, for those of you who are watching, if you like what you hear, if you like what you see, give this episode a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next time.